Hawkesbury River School Prawn is a bigger school prawn. It has a better shelf life, and um, most people think it has a better flavour because these Hawkesburys just have a good name, and um, they're very like they're good for eating. And there's also a very high demand for them in the bait market for recreational fishers. This is Fishtails, a seafood podcast. I'm John Sussman. Located just 24 kilometres north of Sydney Central, the Hawkesbury River is surrounded by rich bushland and natural attractions. The Hawkesbury and its associated main tributary, the Nepean River, almost encircle the metropolitan region of Sydney. The Hawkesbury Nepean River system emerges from the foothills of the Blue Mountains and winds its way east as the Hawkesbury River to meet the sea at Broken Bay. Although almost part of the suburban Sydney sprawl, commercial fishing and oyster farming are still major activities on the Hawkesbury, with large quantities of school prawns, eels, fin fish and oysters sent daily to the Sydney market. But over the years, the fleet of commercial fishermen has reduced to a point where there are very few remaining and fewer still entering the world of commercial fishing. From the outside, the Hawkesbury could be viewed as a place where fishermen go to die. Paul Equilina, known as Nipper, is an exception. Young, enthusiastic and committed, he is part of the next generation of professional fishermen who are as committed to the environment on the Hawkesbury River as they are in love with their job. Um, hi, I'm Nipper or Paul Aquilina. I work the Upper Hawkesbury at Wiseman's Ferry. Um, it's just a pretty river and I just do different methods of fishing to keep me keen. I like it just because it's got those, it's a big river valley and it's got these beautiful big mountains rolling down to the river. And then um, during the week, like apart from other fishermen, you 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 very rarely see a boat. Like I'll see um, a fella down the river, Scotty Kell, he has a wakeboarding school and um, you'll see him. And then apart from that, I might see one or two recreational fishers or the local houseboat guy or that's about it. It's just beautiful, it's quiet, it's peaceful. And then you've also got like your beautiful, it's just good scenery. You can look around the river, go run around the river and jump off all the rocks into the water or swimming or water skiing or we do a bit of wakeboarding and swimming and it's just nice. Where I live, Waterfront, it's um, 66 66 kilometres from the M1 motorway bridge, so about 76 k's from the ocean upstream. For some, it's through intergenerational transfer of fishing rights, boats or equipment. For others, it's through formal training and a clear career path. For Nipper, inspiration came in the form of a movie. For a young fellow growing up in landlocked suburban Sydney, this motivation to get to sea has taken him into a world from which he won't turn back. I watched Perfect Storm on the TV and um, I wanted to become a fisherman after watching that, so I went and did it. I had a friend who owned a trawler out of Greenwell Point and I went to sea with them and then I leased the business and then deckhanded and then bought a business and then I just haven't turned back since. I started in 2008. I fished out of, um, I guess, the Hawkesbury, um, the Crookhaven, Shoalhaven on the river and out at sea. We've worked out at um, Bermagui. I've worked out of Sydney Harbour on the fish trawlers there and then I've worked out of Yamba with my partner. The Hawkesbury River Estuary supports the second largest commercial coastal fishery of estuary prawns, oysters and fish in New South Wales, with a wholesale value of nearly $6 million. Fishermen use a multitude of harvesting techniques in the Hawkesbury, including meshing of fish and prawns, hand and pole line fishing, trapping of mud crabs, lobsters and fish, trawling or purseining, beach hauling and even diving for abalone and sea urchins. For Nipper, his love of one species sees him trawling the upper reaches of the Hawkesbury for the revered school prawn. The Hawkesbury River school prawn is renowned for its unique size, sweetness and deep umami characteristics. It is the standout school prawn in New South Wales, which makes it so popular amongst chefs and highly valued by consumers and for recreational fishermen as bait. Um, well, I target all your fin fish varieties in an estuarine environment. So we've got our flathead, brim, jewfish, whiting, mullet, blackfish or ludric as they're called. Um, I sometimes chase hair tail down the bottom end of the river in the wintertime. 
sometimes chase bull sharks. Then you got your like your staple species, which is my um, uh, school prawns and longfin eels. It was always mullet and eels, and mullet pay good money in the winter time, but to catch mullet we don't like. I don't really like going meshing because it's night work. So then we settled on the eels and the prawns because it's all work in daylight hours. So there was just mainly, it was a daylight fishery and I'd much rather work in the daytime than the nighttime. Hawkes River school prawn is a bigger school prawn. It has a better shelf life and um, most people think it has a better flavour. So that's why I went to targeting them school prawns instead of doing it in Tugra Lake or doing it in the Hunter or the Clarence because these Hawkesbury's just have a good name and um, they're very, like, they're good for eating and there's also a very high demand for them in the bait market for recreational fishers. I reckon it's awesome. Like, one little prawn can do three spawns in its lifetime and then they can make, like, hundreds of thousands of babies. So it's very hard to catch that prawn out. And we got a size limit and a mesh size till the little ones can get out. And then also we've got more than 50% of the rivers closed to trawling. So there's still lots of places they can go and hide. And they reckon um, only 4% of the rivers worked each day because, like, most of us will go and work the same areas you catch them. Not everywhere holds prawns or enough prawns to keep targeting. So I really reckon it's really really sustainable i can't see anything wrong with the practice we do eels are the best because you pretty much make an eel trap put bait in it leave it out all night and check it the next day it's a very easy low cost fishery the only problem with that fishery is you've got to keep them alive and that's where the costs come in when you're running tanks or air or um and then you've got to run them around deliver them and because they're not a very um I guess, wanted species, they can be hard to get rid of, so you're always running around, running around, running around. But the catching part's easy. It's just bait in the trap and check it the next day. Estuary prawn trawlers have been operating in the Hawkesbury River since the 1940s. They use otter trawl nets, which include mandatory bycatch reduction devices. Otter trawl nets are nets that are pulled through the water column the mouth of which is held open by two large doors attached to either side of the net. The fishery operates within a complex system of temporary and permanent closures, gear controls and management measures designed to ensure that fishing has minimal impact on the sensitive habitat such as the seagrass beds. It's a highly controlled artisan fishery which is innately sustainable. If we're working out front of my house, I just roll out of bed when the kookaburras call, which is just before first light. And I'll roll out of bed, I'll run down to the boat, I'll check the oil, um, engine oil, gearbox oil and water. Um, I'll put all the hatches back on, I'll start it. I'll um, walk up to the shed, go get the ute and um, fill it with ice and then take it down the boat and fill the boat with ice. And then I'll run back up the wharf and um, the kids will wake up when my car comes past. So. I'll run back up because we live waterfront, so it's only 10 metres from the boat. So we run back up the house and say bye to the kids and maybe have a bit of toast and then I'll jump on the boat and go to work. But if I'm down the bottom of the river, I've got to leave at like 3 o'clock or 3.30 and then I've got a long steam or jump in the ute and go down to where I leave my boat and then put a boat in to go to my mooring and then jump on the boat from the mooring. So just depends what's going on at the time of year and how much rainfall we've had. We tow a trawl, so we've got an otter prawn trawl set up, which is um, otter boards, which are doors. They go on the bottom of the river and spread the net open. And just to find a prawn, you pretty much you understand what's going on and then you'll kind of do a shot, which is towing the net or towing the trawl. And you'll tow it, a, you'll tow it at a depth for, of an area and then, they might not be there and you might work a bit deeper or shallower until you find them or you'll go to a new area. But it's mainly just what you know up in your head. Like you've got to actually just do the shot to find out. Before we winch up, which is pulling the net in, I fill the sorting tray with water 
And then um, when when the net comes up and that, we spill the bag, which is the cot end. We spill that into the sorting tray full of water. We sort the odd fish we get, which we very rarely get any. Um, pick the few leaves and mangrove seeds and sticks and sometimes the odd clump of mud. And you pick them out and then once they're all clean, I push them into a box or um, onto the Riddler, which is a grading thing, which is um, we'll pick out, we'll make the big prawns go to the bottom and the small prawns will fall through the holes and go stay up the top. And then they'll go straight into me um, either a slurry or into the cooker or um, straight onto ice in boxes in the ice box. You um, unload the boat, whether it's unload one boat to the other boat, to drive back to the boat ramp, to pull a boat out, to then jump in the car and drive the prawns home to package. Or um, I tie up at my own wharf and unload the boat onto my ute, park it in the shed, um, and then put the prawns in the cool room. And then I'll go inside and like see the kids and Alex and have some lunch or afternoon tea or whatever and hang out for an hour. And then we'll all go down to the shed together and pretty much spend all our afternoon to about eight, nine o'clock at night packaging. The life of a commercial fisherman is one of constant unknown. From one day to the next, their job can go from boom to bust. Seasons, weather, climate change, tides, gear, recreational fishes and even untoward interference can all play a part in delivering the good or the bad for a fisherman on a daily basis. One where nothing goes wrong. Nothing at all. Just get in, get it done and go home. That makes a good day. I can wake up in the morning and get water in my gum boot. Then my day's ruined from the start. And then or you or just the boat breaks down or you rip your net or you get hooked up which you're stuck on the bottom because you wasn't watching what you were doing, you caught a log or a rock reef or something. Or yeah, heaps of things can happen. The boat can sink. That's happened twice. I just come out in the morning and my boat was on the bottom. And then you're like, well, that sucks. And then, no, oh, looks like I got a day off. And then ring the mates and calm boys, when your day's over, my boat sunk and I need help. And then you put the boat in and then you've got to go and get all your stuff out of your boat that's floated all up and down the river. And then you go and get all your stuff back. And then generally I use me, I swim down. I tied the boat up to a truck one time and then to my four-wheel drive the next time and I towed it up into shallower water and then waited for the tide to come down. Once the tide come down, I got the fire pumps ready and we pumped it out and then it floated it. And then we had to just pull it all apart and fix everything. Not a fun time. Learning to be a good fisher is a complex and lifelong process. Fishers learn by trial and error or through knowledge handed down through the generations. The local professional fishing industry works closely with Ocean Watch, a national not-for-profit environmental business that works to advance sustainability in the Australian seafood industry. The Ocean Watch Master Fisherman Program, of which Nipper is a graduate, was developed to improve and recognise individual fishermen's knowledge, experience and environmental performance. From a peak of nearly 600 commercial fishers in the late 1970s to a fleet of less than 30 now, the Hawkesbury River, like many fishing areas, is suffering from a lack of new entrants coming into the industry. The professional fishing industry contributes millions of dollars into many of the local towns, including Nipper's home of Spencer. These towns and villages evolve from fishing communities and still identify with their professional fishing heritage. Along with the loss of delicious, fresh local seafood, there is a concern that a decline in the fishing industry could lead to a loss of identity for some of these traditional fishing towns. Not having any job security would be one, because we don't know if they're just going to close it down the next day, and that's why it makes it very hard to invest. But somebody like me, I don't, I've just, all, I just put it all in, and I've invested a heap, and it all seems to be working, but if, if they did close it, I'd just I'd come unstuck in a big way. So we've got no job security. Um, it can be hard to sell your product at times because, like the eels, there's not much demand, so I only catch what I can sell. I don't get greedy. Um, and then also you've got a problem with prices because I'm doing bait and tackle and there's a lot of people um, that are in Sydney that I deal with, they think, they should be paying me what the Sydney fish market's paying. But 
they don't take into account that a school prawn from any other system but the Hawkesbury is a completely different prawn than what I'm catching. So they're all, they'll be like, oh, oh, the prawns were paying, uh, for argument's sake, say they were paying $10. Well, if I'm sell, I sell them for 20 and they'd be like, no, I only want to pay $10 because that's all they're paying in the market. But the difference between my prawn and the market prawn is it's the same day caught and the quality is just you can't compare them because they're two different prawns of the same species but they're different prawns and the just the quality is so much different. So, the yeah, we have a lot of problems with people trying to drive a bargain, job security, and then also, yes, yeah, selling your catch. Sometimes it can be very difficult. It's definitely gone down because the age of a commercial fisherman's getting older. So whether they're cutting back, um, pretty much in this game, it's um, people passing away, cutting back or getting divorced or retiring. That's just pretty much the blunt truth of it all. There's a lot of yeah, there's young people that do come in and um they don't seem to last real long. Some people are lucky and I guess some people just aren't and it just hasn't worked for them or their lifestyle. So for my lifestyle this works great. It seems to be working and I see a very little number of young people coming in because you you can make more money doing other things like and some people don't have the passion for it. The people that come in and start because they think you make a heap of money out of it, they're the first to go and then other people um, and then you'll get your few that stay. But the main thing is that it's definitely an ageing industry where most people that are doing this industry, most of them are in their retirement age and they've done it as just a hobby, like they've bought it into as a hobby or they've bought in at a later stage of life just because they always wanted to give it a go. But, yeah, there's definitely – I'd be the – I'm the youngest on the Hawkesbury. I don't know anyone younger than me. Um, most blokes, like, there's a few blokes in their 40s and then the rest are in their 50s and 60s. There's blokes in their 70s and then there's um, two old gentlemen down the bottom of the river and I think his father's – um, he's 98 or 100, 100, I think, and they still work together, his fa- father and son. Nipper is an eternal optimist with enthusiasm that is as infectious as it is inspiring. With partner Alex, who is also a professional fisher, they plan to build their business, exploring other fishing opportunities and to shorten their route to market, building out direct relationships with both chefs, retailers and even consumers. We're going to buy a place. That's one thing because we, we're in a waterfront place now and we want to buy on a mountain so we can have a cool lookout. So we're looking to buy a house in the local area and then we want to start Alex off in, um, in my other boat and get her doing that. Um, and then we've got to make our boats more kid-friendly so we can take a kid to work each. And we would like to then eventually, in the next five to ten years, I'd like to buy an ocean boat and expand and chase king prawns and still keep the, um, the river boat to do school prawns, but we'd also really like to go and do king prawns and then focus more on a, instead of a bait and tackle industry, more of a, a cooked market and like catching big, beautiful, big cooked prawns and have a place up the coast somewhere where you can go and chase your cooks, you chase your prawns whenever the weather lets you out, whether that's three days a week or seven, and we're hoping that we could set her boat, whether we do cooked prawns out of her boat and I stick to the bait or we were actually looking at doing a live prawn and because um, live prawns you obviously get a better money for, whether the live prawns are the bait and tackle industry or whether it's more for a restaurant-based industry. So, we've um, yeah, we've just got a – I've been playing around, working out how to keep them alive and stuff like that, but the problem is his room. So if um, – if you have all this water and um, tanks and aerators and stuff taking up all this room, well, you're not really going to be able to put the hours in on that boat, so you'll run out of room. So, yeah, we're looking at how we're going to do it efficiently and then we've got to work out how we're going to get them from our place to, I guess, in Sydney, which is a good hour and a half drive by the time you get anywhere. So, yeah, we've got a bit to look into that, whether we put a worker on to deliver or we um, do it ourselves or we have people come get it from us or, yeah, we've just got to work out what we're doing because we've already done all the live eels and stuff. 
but the prawns are a lot harder to keep alive than just than the eels. So all the tanks and all that kind of thing and the infrastructure I've already got in place is all got to be done again to do that. Like all good fishermen, Nipper is proud of what he does, loves the water and loves what he catches. Oh, I like being out on the water and I like I feel proud like as much as I really dislike packaging, but when you finish packaging for the day and you count up, oh yeah, I had a hundred kilo today, like or somebody buys it and rings you, oh mate, them prawns were beautiful or Oh, geez, they were good. I've got so many fish on them. Like, it makes you proud because you're like, well, I did that. And then you'll make all your nets and then you'll put all your work into your nets and your gear and then you'll use them for the first time and they work. Or every time you winch that winch up, you're like, geez, this net works good. I only made that last week. Like, you get all proud because you made it all happen yourself. Although the commercial fishing industry faces many challenges, there are some bright signs for the future. With enthusiastic and energetic fishermen like Nipper and Alex, supported by the encouragement and stewardship of agencies like Ocean Watch, the industry remains a viable and important part of the Hawkesbury River. With a growing interest for local food and even more so the awakening of awareness by consumers of just how special wild seafood is, the future for young fishermen on the Hawkesbury River looks bright. This is Fish Tales, a seafood podcast. A Deep in the Weeds production, I'm John Sussman. Follow us on Instagram at Fishtails Seafood Podcast or email us at fishtailspodcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay tuned for more tales from beneath the surface of the seafood world every Friday on your podcast app.